Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Jaya Prabhu Pada 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 Gaur Premanandi Hare Hare Gaur There you go That was a good start, isn't it? You only start. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, would you guys like to say it to my listeners? What is the meaning of the chant? The chanting. The chanting, there you go. Sure. Well, uh, Hare Krishna's chant Hare Krishna because um, the name of Krishna, uh, it's pure, it's transcendental. We understand Krishna to be God's most uh, personal name. God has unlimited number of names because God is unlimited. But we understand Krishna to be one of his most uh, intimate names. And the reason we chant is because it connects us to uh, the spiritual world when we are chanting. Yeah, It's a little bit like being in contact with uh, another realm. Yeah. Okay. And that could be also considered as like something auspicious, isn't it? Like especially when we're starting this podcast. It's very auspicious. Yeah. It's purifying. Uh, it's very uplifting for the consciousness, for the heart and the mind and the soul. Definitely. Yeah. All righty. Mm. All righty. God's name brings us closer to Krishna. Mm. So Krishna Prabhupada says he's the prime living being. So when we come closer to him, we get uplifted. We never bring God down, mm. but we become uplifted. So it's always... Mm beneficial or as you said auspicious okay okay and especially when we are doing this podcast right now here at millifield isn't it yes. that's right you're in a <laughs> you're in a sacred realm here you exactly <laughs> so i'm so curious for today all right that's my feeling like what's going on with me all right so all about like i have Kalia Prabhu with me and I got Ladini with me, right? So for me, I feel like well, I'm, a, I'm one of that aware person all about Hare Krishna. And if I would be providing you that feedback, I think both of you, like you have the 
birch and having that level of consciousness. What do you think about this? Uh, it's very complimentary of you, Bipin. <laughs> I hope that there's some, there's some uh, element of fact in it because we're both practicing to mm. our best endeavor the mm. process of Krishna consciousness. Not that we have any special qualification or me personally, but if we take to the practice, then um, you can judge the result. Prabhupada always said it's scientific, and that means that it has a process. You should be able to measure the result, so it's subjective. If we just keep on chanting and uh, and associating with people who are like-minded, you'll find the the benefit is is uh, self-evident. Mm. Okay. Yes, we, we are all uh, devotees of Krishna, like in, in our international organization, which is called ISKCON, it stands for the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. All, mm-hmm. of, our, all of our members, uh, we are endeavoring to uh, um, achieve pure love of God. But we all understand that this is a process. It takes time. Yes, some individuals will advance faster than others. Some are more dedicated than others. Um, but it, it's so it is very much an individual journey. But on the other hand, it's also a very much a community uh, okay. journey as well. Yeah. Alrighty, alrighty. So let's focus on Millifield then. Okay. Mm. As you guys are here, so what is all about the history of New Gokula Millifield Temple? Well, I might let Kalia probably okay. start okay. this one. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I saw that question is one of your openers, Bibin, and it's uh, it's hard to quantify exactly. When I first got involved with the Hare Krishna movement um, 45, 44 years ago, 1979, I met the Hare Krishna people in Sydney. And right at that time, they were very excited to acquire a piece of land and uh, fulfill the kind of um, Prabhupada's... Uh, vision of having uh, places where people could live closer to closer to nature and closer to God so the devotees were alive with that that um, enthusiasm and uh, they purchased a plot of land west of Windsor in a place called Kola River okay and uh, after that farm was established after several years they had flooding problems in the area so they had to re- relocate the land and it took them a few years to uh, find a, a, a suitable alternative. One thing in Kola River, it was about 50 or 60 acre property and uh, it didn't really have the the size to kind of develop a village style of thing, which was an aspiration that we, we'd thought of. So I was away in New Zealand for several years and when I came back in the early 90s, they okay. re- relocated to here. So it was a transposition of the original idea um, to live closer to nature and to be able to grow our own pr- produce and have cows. Okay, okay. So my memory all about coming to Millifield Temple is all about since from Sydney. So I was talking with Kalia Prabhu. So that was all about I already started coming to Millifield Temple. Like it's my probably more than 10 times over here, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So for me, like it's a heaven. You know what I'm talking about? So I believe like if there would be some places around all about the heaven that's somewhere in the earth, and whenever I come over here, I feel that level of spirituality inside myself. Yeah. And I was also sharing all about like the religion I follow with Kalia Prabhu when I met him uh, this afternoon. Yeah. So it's all about how I symbolize Lord Krishna as well. So, yeah. So... Even like for me, I call Lord Krishna as Almighty. That is all about like what my religion has actually taught me since my childhood, right? Mm. But on today, I thought like I'll be focusing on my audience as well. Let's say the, I'll be using the same terminology, okay? Like someone who is aware, okay? All about Bhagavad Gita, all about Lord Krishna, right? And also all about Iskon, right? So, what is the source of inspiration? Like, all right, let's create a temple at Millifield. There is already a temple at North Sydney, right? Mm. So, I have heard like there is another project around somewhere in regional Tari, is it? Or no. Tomari? We have a we have a nice um, 
rural ashram in Mawulamba. Okay. Mm. Ladini was residing there for quite a number of years. Mm. Okay. Mm. Yeah, so we have, uh, like throughout Australia, we have uh, several temples. In, uh, I think in every, or most, almost all of the, the capital cities throughout Australia, we have an Iskon Hare Krishna temple. Uh, we have maybe four or five farms, such mm-hmm. as this one. Yeah, because a, a part of um, the Hare Krishna movement um, mission or the, the purpose is to practice uh, cow protection right we protect right. cows uh, we also try to live uh, a very simple life and often that is difficult to achieve in the city mm-hmm. uh, you know where um, people are working most of the time they're earning a lot of money and so living a natural and a self-sufficient life is actually quite difficult in the city so that is uh, perhaps the main reason why we set up farms and also what we do want to show is a model of the original ancient vedic lifestyle okay in india yeah that's what we are aiming for also with these farms there you go mm. living around with the cows yes isn't it mm. so there would be a lot of meanings behind if someone goes deeply into the bhagavad gita Right. Definitely, yeah, yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But anyways, like something interesting, I also got the same feeling if I go to North Sydney. Oh, yes, yeah. the, the uh, temple in uh, exactly. North Sydney. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yes. So, as I was mentioning, that is all about the spirituality mm. for me. Yes. So, on top of that, definitely something religious as well. But I do get that same feeling. Mm. Yeah. I think that is all about uh, how we... Follow Lord Krishna. Yes. Isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, I could see around here, I could still see houses. I could see still, I could still see people moving around, right? Definitely I can say like this temple here or a cow farm, right? Is definitely in the heart of a community, right? Yes. yes. So, what sort of... Um, catch up and tie up with the community people this temple is doing at the moment? Uh, well, I, I think any of, uh, or all of our centres, um, one of the the main uh, preaching um, sort of aspects, you could say, of the Hare Krishna movement in general is that we like to serve out uh, free vegetarian food. Okay. Uh, that That is open to anyone. Anyone can come here. Uh, from early in the morning to late at night and and uh, partake in our vegetarian food, which has been offered to Lord Krishna first. So this, this vegetarian food, uh, it is described as being uh, food for both the body and the soul because um, when we cook all of our food, like all Hare Krishna centers around the world, uh, we are cooking for the pleasure of Krishna. So we will, uh, Hare Krishnas, at least in our own movement in ISKCON, we never just serve out vegetarian food. It is very vegetarian food that has been offered to Krishna with a, uh, with a, a particular procedure. So the idea is that Krishna first enjoys that food and then when he has enjoyed the food, then it is served out to the people. And what happens then, that through that process, the food itself becomes spiritualized. And okay. it, it's actually very beneficial for one's uh, consciousness when one eats that food. So the food is beneficial both for the, the soul and the body. And this is uh, one of our main um, approaches to preaching, actually. Uh, we do cook very good food. Oh yeah, I'm the witness. <laughs> we, yeah, we, we we get we get a lot of uh, good comments, and uh, we have restaurants also throughout Australia, Hare Krishna restaurants, uh, but also here on New Go Cool. You know, we have this. Um, uh, very nice uh, cow protection program and people do love to come here and they love to feed the cows they love to just interact with the cows in some way yeah okay okay i think all over the world the uh hari krishna feast is the main event at the temples yes. and uh, we've yeah. expanded it from a sunday feast to a weekend program so saturday is popular sunday is popular yeah and okay. um, locals are also there was a group of local hit people here today and yesterday there was also some of our neighbours came over to the event mm. so everybody has the opportunity and we, we do have some chanting in the local towns from time to time mm-hmm. and uh, pass out some invitations for people to come along mm. Okay so that's all about spreading love and spreading all about the prasadam yeah, Yes, well it's 
You know, our understanding is that um, like all living beings are spiritual by nature, you know, and all living beings uh, ultimately uh, exist in a loving relationship with the Supreme, and we understand that that Supreme is a person known as Krishna. So um, we try and uh, teach people a, a Krishna conscious lifestyle in which Krishna is at the center of life, our lives, uh, and in that way we can show people how to experience loving relationships with all living beings. You know, relationships in which um, everyone benefits and uh, nobody is uh, persecuted, you know, because there is so much exploitation in the world today. So this is actually the Krishna conscious lifestyle and the Krishna conscious model that we are trying to achieve here. And we are also trying to show other people and teach other people simply because we don't like to see other living beings suffer. Okay. Yeah. All righty. So living living a lifestyle, a practical lifestyle, in harmony with the other creatures, is a fundamental aspect of, of a higher consciousness. Is recognizing the divinity in all life, and so um, Krishna consciousness is very practical and logical. That the the divine spark, and this is coming up in your questionnaire. Exactly, the, the divine spark is symptomized by the by the life symptoms. So whether there's a living entity, whether in, this, in a developed state or a less developed state, we offer respect to the living entity. And one way is to give spiritual food. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. And it's all practical, isn't it? It's all practical. It's so practical. Yes. The, yeah. One of the wonderful things about uh, Krishna consciousness is that um, it uh, has an effect on all levels, on the, the physical level, on the spiritual level. Uh, it is very uh, much relevant in terms of our day-to-day activities. Uh, it's relevant in terms of our very long-term goals in life. Um, and within the ancient Vedas of India, which we follow, the, the Vedic scriptures, uh, we are taught about how to live a Krishna conscious lifestyle in so many different contexts, such as, for example, uh, cos- cosmology, uh, geography, um, psychology, sociology, um, agriculture. It really covers all the different aspects of life. And in that way, um, the original uh, Vedic lifestyle uh, is um, demonstrated to be a very, very good option in terms of sustainability, right, for both human beings and other living beings also. Okay. Yeah. So, we got an idol of Lord Radha and Krishna inside the temple, right? And on the same other hand, like we're also talking about all the practicability of uh, living in the nature and living with the nature, isn't it? Mm. So what do you think, like, what is the significance of worshipping the idol inside the temple? Mm. All about the temple and idol of Lord Krishna and Radha. Okay, well, you can take it. It could be a silly you. question for you, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Either of us but I'm saying, like, I'm still in that <laughs> aware phase, okay? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll give you a subjective answer, uh, somewhat subjective answer, Bipin. I think you'll find in... Uh, traditional as we're just carrying on the point of the um the vedic tradition and it's you know more idealistic uh original form then in the center of every village is a temple where people the natural inclination is to is to see a, a higher being and a higher a higher purpose and therefore there's some practical form of that worship so that manifests in the form in the vedas of worshiping uh deity the deity form and so the the um, the nice concept then you see in in the traditional villages is people work and do their occupations generally something around producing their livelihood their food stuff looking after the cows and they they're presenting some offerings to the lord in the temple and it's a place where the people congregate with this divine with this uh, spiritual motive rather than say you know go to the football or the hotel mm-hmm. um you know people are still following that that uh very uplifting tradition of meeting together in the temple, offering worship to the Lord, praises of the Lord, and the produce to the Lord. Okay. 
So one, one thing I want to also respond to that uh, Vipin mentioned. So the word idol is not actually applicable to the deity. I believe the English word idol mm-hmm. means a, a fabricated, like a, a form that is fabricated and then idolized. So um, the deity representation in, in the temple is different from that because it's not something that has been an invented or fabricated by human beings. It's a representation of the Supreme Lord as it is described in the Vedas themselves. So, and, and if deity worship is done according to the authorized scripture, which is the Vedic scripture, then uh, Krishna himself is present in that deity just as much as he is in the spiritual world, if it is done according to uh, the guidelines that are recommended, which is very, very different to idol worship. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Let me tell you, this was an intentional question, okay? Yeah. So, <laughs> a lot of my audience, they would be someone like they're quite young. And I thought like if I would be raising this question right here, like it's the right platform for me, just to make them understand all yeah. about the differences between yeah, this. Sure. Alrighty? Yeah, yeah. Because at the moment, like we have to go through a bit of modernization and a bit of like traditional way of following Lord Krishna. What do you think? Uh, now, yeah. one of the examples could be someone who came to Australia from, let's say, India or Nepal, right? They will come to this temple with their parents, and we see that variation on everything. So, who right. are quite aware about it? Okay, so in terms of the pure. Uh, philosophical teaching there doesn't have to be any alterations or changes made according to the original teaching of the Vedas which was recorded uh, 5,000 years ago that was the last time it was recorded in the mm-hmm. Vedas it's been um, that teaching has been around since time immemorial but if we are discussing lifestyle as opposed to the pure philosophy many probably most Hare Krishnas do find that they make certain um, compromise or not not actually compromises but um, they you know they might um, use certain facilities that are there like if we, we can say that the modern world um, but again uh, as I was saying earlier it's very much an individual um, journey yeah some Hare Krishnas find that they can live very very close to the original Vedic traditional model lifestyle others will find that they depend quite heavily on modern conveniences and facilities yeah but um, as far as the actual philosophical teaching goes uh, which is recorded in these books that have been translated by um, His Divine Ghost uh, Srila Prabhupada A.C. Bhaktivedanta Srila okay. Prabhupada the philosophy is identical for all of us and w- we recognize this ourselves in our international community we recognize that yes we all agree that this is the philosophy and it's not going to change but we are also tolerant of each other's lifestyles because we are all individual mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think another thing that you can notice in the temple here and probably anywhere is that there's young and old people Definitely, so there's a diversity there. So many young people, so many old people. So it's appealing to, to something deeper within us than just our, our body, female or male, old or young. Exactly. And that, that was something like I was curious on, okay? So does this temple or let's say like um, this program, okay, we have some activities all about attracting the younger people? Yes, are you asking if we have special mm-hmm. uh, youth programs? Exactly. Um, well, what we do find is that um, our kirtans, our congregational chanting, is very, very popular uh, for the, the youth, for the younger people. Um, we have, um, uh, what are we calling them, youth melas or something, uh, especially up in uh, the Marwulumba mm-hmm. Temple, where I, uh, which is just uh, south of the Gold Coast. Um, there are a lot of... Um, uh, what we call second generation devotees uh, they are devotees who were born into the movement and um, all of them seem to be very attracted especially to the congregational chanting and a lot of them are very good musicians and so they tend to uh, create their own programs yeah, where they are Th- those programs are based around getting together and especially doing the, the kirtans the chanting uh, and so forth and um, 
Um, definitely, uh, various temples in Australia uh, will put on uh, special programs for the youth. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, Kalia Prabhu, perhaps you can respond to that with regards to New Gokul Sydney region and uh, youth programs. Well, um, back in 2010, my son was at university here in Newcastle, and he saw that some of the temples were putting on some nice kirtan programs, which were attracting a lot of the youth. He just returned from India a couple of years before and uh, he was kind of missing the festive mood so we had an idea. We put together a, a kirtan, 24-hour kirtan here. So he invited all his young friends from around Australia and some of the, some of the slightly older ones and uh, he um, established a really nice festival that year which we've had smaller versions of over the years and uh, as you pointed out, a lot of that gen- newer generation are really attracted to the vibrant kirtan. Mm. You know, kirtan yoga has become popular. Um, you know, even in, in, in the secular world out there, people are starting to know about kirtan. Mm. And uh, a, a lot of our youth are leading that kind of new wave mm. of mm-hmm. uh, spiritual music. Mm. So, I, I, yeah, I think that that is the strongest sort of drive at the moment with regards to the youth programs. It is the congregational chanting. And there are some very good musicians who are leading that part of the movement globally. And that yeah. they, they will travel around internationally and do uh, programs and, uh, at different temples uh, around the world. Mm. Yeah. They also have a youth bus tour every year. I think they might have missed out a few with the COVID. Mm. Um, they usually come into the different temples and they stop by here for a couple of nights in camp mm. yeah. and uh, have some different activities. So some programs there, but it's a little bit internal for the for the ISKCON youth. We we haven't established anything directed at um, youth programs mm. as such. Mm. So it could be the program is all about offering a click to the younger people. There's something like a click for them. We, 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 a we divine are, click, let's say. Well, we are reaching out to all ages. We yeah. are not specifically aimed at any particular age group. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what, how we live as Krishna, con- uh, as uh, devotees of Krishna, uh, there are basic things that we all partake in. You know, it's it's a particular lifestyle where we all, for example, we all abstain from drugs and alcohol and meat eating and illicit sex Mm -hmm. and um, gambling and things like that. All of us do that regardless of the age that we are in, regardless of which country we are living in. Uh, We all do things like um, uh, we worship our gurus or, you know, specifically Srila Prabhupada who is our preeminent guru. Mm -hmm. Um, We all uh, travel to the holy places in India, you know, uh, uh, to visit. We, we go on pilgrimage and we like to associate together and, and listen to the, the teachings that are coming from the Shastras, from the, the Vedic scripture. So these are, these are things that really all Hare Krishnas do, the young people as well as the old people. Okay. And even the children can partake in that yeah, in their own way. So... Um, it's not so much where there is um, a difference, you know, that is specifically prevalent, uh, prominent uh, according to age, yeah, if I okay. put it in that way. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Now that's pretty much clear for me, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for replying that in a very simple way, okay? Mm. Let's talk something about interfaith cooperation. So my experience, like when I visited to this temple last time, I think there was a guy from Lebanon. So he was here to have some lunch. Alrighty. And I asked him, like, what brought you here? He gave me a divine answer. Alrighty. So he said to me, like, no matter, like, where you go, could be a church or could be a mosque or wherever, it's a God bless. So I came here. That was his reply to me. Okay. And he was definitely a guy from Lebanon already. Mm. So what sort of interfaith incorporation Gokula Tama is all about playing as a role to the community around here? Mm. What drives them to come here? Yeah. We are what is called uh, non-sectarian. Non-sectarian. That means that we don't discriminate against exactly. any other religion. Yeah, um, I can still remember... Um, 
that magazine that we produced here in Australia. I think it was called Atma. It was yeah. Uh, yeah, it was one of the earliest magazines we used to distribute in Australia, and uh, one of the the big uh, um, article, the the feature articles in that was about this uh, the nature of our uh, non sectarianism, and uh, in that article we had written. Um, you know, various names of God. So we had Allah, Jehovah, mm-hmm. Buddha, uh, Buddha uh, Yahweh. Yeah, Yahweh, you know. And in that article, we were explaining to people that uh, you can chant any name of God. It doesn't have to be Krishna. You know, we chant Krishna because we understand that this is uh, the most uh, effective or you know, name in terms of chanting, right? Because in the Vedas, it expl- it explains that Krishna is one of uh, the Lord's most uh, intimate names. So we chant Krishna, but uh, one can chant any bona fide name of God um, and uh, gain the benefit of that chanting. Uh, but yes, we are definitely uh, we, we definitely do not uh, discriminate against. Uh, any other uh, religion or philosophical belief. Uh, we're, we're very open to discussing. Let's talk something about the ball injuries around the temple. Okay. I can see every time I come here, I see a lot of keen ball injuries around the kitchen, around the temple, around the farm. Where do they come from? Well, uh, some of them are, uh, they have a local crew here of uh, 10, 10 people live on the community and then there's uh, a few families just in the neighbourhood and we're all pretty nice close-knit uh, group and then uh, when we have big turnouts like in this Easter weekend where we have hundreds and hundreds of people coming then we're really dependent on volunteer help to make the whole thing work and most of our people that come here recognise that we're only a small group trying to you know take on some ambitious undertakings and if people just chip in like this afternoon when you came I was sort of caught between talking exactly to you the surrounded cook, by the devotees yeah the cook was asking me we need some help is in the kitchen I just walked over to a group and people and I said we need some help and they just jumped up okay what can we do mm-hmm. <laughs> so there's a nice mood like that and we also have a volunteer an official the volunteer program now where people uh, have a programs where people traveling around the world can uh, work on farms in exchange for accommodation and uh, food. So we have several of those just uh, in the last few months now that we're getting on board to help us. And uh, uh, most of them are having a fairly positive experience with, uh, you know, living in a community, a spiritual community. So far, the, we've got some high high ratings on the, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> on the website. So, uh, uh, you know, there's different ways that volunteers can interact. Ultimately, the whole thing is a volunteer organisation to volunteer our services to the Supreme Lord. And whether it's done as a sort of experiment or done with conviction, it still has, uh, you know, gives us the opportunity to live in a community of like-minded people. Exactly. So, is there any way where, let's say, I want to be the volunteer? I know the way, okay? Like, I'm just asking this question, like, in terms of my audience here. How can they contact the temple if they want to be a volunteer? Yeah, they can go onto our website, newgokula.com, and uh, there's indications there how they can contact the management for opportunities for uh, volunteer service, services. There's also, as I mentioned, with the, with the programs for Workaway and Woof, we have a, 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 a listing, website listing for... for um, uh, travelers who want to volunteer they can go on to workaway.com mm-hmm. and they can look up the Hare Krishna farm you go cooler and uh, contact the manager for volunteering here okay so let's talk something about the collaboration this Gokula farm is making with the community okay is there any organizations that is collaborating with the new Gokula farm at the moment what about this honey uh, no, with this honey, honey we're purchasing lo- locally Oh, okay. local honey. We, we are producing some of our own honey, but um, the demand is higher than the supply at the moment. Alrighty. <laughs> so that's the evidence, like a lot of devotees are visiting the Gokula farm at the moment. Yeah, sure. Isn't it? 
Yeah. I don't know like how to relate this okay, but uh all about like I was mentioning about spirituality, isn't it? Yes. I think like I shouldn't be missing like all about the mental health. Mm. I shouldn't be missing all about the emotional wellness not only within the community. Let's say a global devotee at the moment, okay. Mm. Is there any way how a Krishna faith uh, or is there any program Hare Krishna faith has for the devotees all about let's say mental health okay well, not only the spirituality so as we all know sadly uh, mental illness is on the increase globally uh, in australia certainly there are more mental health clin- more and more mental health clinics being established uh, just in the last uh, decade and two decades and three decades um so in terms of uh mental and uh emotional well-being and intellectual well-being uh these are topics that are very much um addressed within our teachings um as you know <laughs> the the very title of our international organization right the international society for krishna consciousness mm-hmm. so excuse me it is very much we very much maintain a focus on this topic of consciousness and when we when we are talking about consciousness we're not just talking uh about the mental activities or the intellectual activities or the emotional activities it's actually the whole package deal yeah because as um you know uh professional psychologists certainly realize that all of these factors are interconnected they impact on each other uh you cannot really look at one of these factors without looking at the other yeah and this is certainly true uh within krishna consciousness we on the other hand we are able to add a fourth dimension to this and this is the spiritual aspect of the individual and uh sadly um uh today's um teaching uh, and training programs within universities right for professions such as psychology and psychiatry uh they do not offer this aspect because they d- they don't have the information this information is given in the vedic scripture it is not uh found uh in great detail in other scriptures either uh but it is found in the vedic scripture for example you know how the soul how the spiritual soul is situated within the material body uh the connection between the spiritual soul and consciousness right how uh the pure the original pure spiritual consciousness of the living being becomes contaminated in this material world and thereby renders the individual uh more or less helpless in terms of how to cope with all the stresses and the sufferings of everyday life so all of this is discussed within the scripture so um um in terms of uh offering uh teachings and uh, a practical lifestyle that is actually going to help the individual living being to alleviate their suffering uh, that is very much a part of our uh outreach program um it's interesting that you should mention this topic because really just say within the last 15 years mm-hmm. th- there has been a push within our global hari krishna movement to start facilitating more programs that are specifically um addressing these issues uh, within a context that the broader public can relate to yeah even though you know we have all along uh like uh, you know the the uh, original hari krishna teachings which is um has been on the earth since time immemorial and it is very much focused on consciousness so it's been around since time immemorial but we need to um actually we need to learn how to package this in a way that uh today's modern uh societies uh are going to understand what we have to offer them exactly. in terms of well-being in terms of well-being so that's something that we are actually learning now globally and as you may uh, appreciate vipin um what you know our challenge is to take this very transcendental knowledge uh which is very um esoteric in many ways mm-hmm. and then to uh in one sense uh 
um, say translate or in, in one sense like to um, put it in a format that is going to be suitable for outreach in different parts of today's communities and society. So that's, our, that's actually a, a very big focus that we are doing uh, right now globally in our movement. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, Ladidi, like as you were mentioning all about materials or let's say being materialistic, isn't it, at the moment? Yeah. Definitely, I would like to drive a Tesla. <laughs> Alrighty, like if I would be honest, isn't it? Yeah. At least I would like to give it a try. Is yeah. there any concept like in Bhagavad Gita where there would be a sense of detachment all about these materials around the world at the moment? Yes. Because I know, like I'm aware, like the iPhone I'm carrying at the moment could be going for like another 10 years, but I don't know, for some reason, I would like to get a new one, you know? Yeah. So, all these like sim- sounds like simple. Mm. It sounds like so simple, right? Mm. I can get another iPhone. Mm. But if I go through that deep concept of like detachment, mm. you know? So, th- there, is, there is an important teaching uh, that really anything in the material world, uh, if it is used for spiritual purposes, for pure, pure spiritual purposes, then the quality, or we could say the vibration of that thing, uh, becomes spiritualized. For example, I'm talking into this microphone mm-hmm. right now. Right, if this very same microphone were to be used to, uh, you know, um, advertise, uh, you know, gambling places and uh, okay. gambling casinos and, you know, um, uh, betting on races and you know all these sorts of uh, worldly and sort of mundane activities then uh, then this microphone would just simply remain as a mundane material object but when it is used uh, for spiritual purposes and then um, the, the energy of that particular object it uh, regains its original spiritual quality so um, with regards to lifestyle, right now you, you were mentioning uh, your iPod, or <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. So um, and materialism. So th- there is another teaching like this that human beings they should work uh, just enough to keep body and soul together. Right. So what this means is that, you know, ideally uh, we should not go running after more money or more things than what we actually uh, really need. Right. And our needs are really determined by what our goals are. So again, our goals are to regain our God consciousness. That's why we're here. That's what the, what this world was designed for. So um, usually we don't need you know, a great deal of material facility in order to achieve that goal. We, 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 we do need to have some facility, but we want to live very simply. And that means also that, you know, rather than slaving away at a job, you know, 10 hours a day for six days a week in the city, for example, uh, we can work very little you know, for our material facility. And most of our time can be used to uh, study the scripture, to help other people, Right, to teach other people uh, you know, about God consciousness and so forth. Yeah. Okay. It's also, it's also uh, really practically experienced that uh, you know, when we just stay busy in devotional activities, um, the, uh, the kind of proclivity or the propensity of the mind to contemplate you know, so many um, you know, uh, forms of, of material enjoyment or, or, or attraction to material things, it, it, sometimes it just doesn't really, uh, you know, evolve because you're just in, engaged in activities which are more or less um, simple and satisfying. Okay. And so devotees are like that. They get together and there's, uh, as devotees, we, we read the Bhagavad Gita and the Bhagavatam and chant Maha Mantra, other devotional songs and... Uh, as you know, with the Nepalese community, it's very uplifting. Exactly. They come here and they dance yeah. in the temple. And <laughs> Putting enjoy the sarees, serving. yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, just an alternative option to the, you know, promotion of all this material enticement is just living a simple and satisfying existence. Mm. Alrighty. What is the concept of dharma? 
like we mentioned a bit about karma. Now, what is the concept of dharma? Well, Srila Prabhupada ex- explains in a book, Dharma, the Way of Transcendence, that dharma is the natural inclination of the soul. In its highest sense, dharma uh, means the, the, the nature of the soul, what its propensities are, and uh, what its highest goal is to, to come back into connection with its relationship with the Supreme Lord. So in the Bhagavad Gita it explains that every, every soul has an eternal relationship with the Lord and that we're, um, we're blocked from, from experiencing that relationship while we're looking in the wrong direction. Mm-hmm. So Dharma means to point us back in, in, a, in, a highly, in a higher spiritual goal and to act in that way. So the Bhagavatam, it begins by stating that the highest dharma is to connect us with loving service to the Lord. And it okay. says any activity which, uh, which evokes or awakens that, in, that interest in loving service is real, real dharma. So dharma has many connotations, but uh, the Vedas, specifically the Bhagavatam, it, it uh, defines that real dharma means to love, love the Lord with all your heart. Okay. Yeah, I was trying to ask a bit about, you know, like all about garlic and onion free food. I had a talk, right. with, talk with one of our young ladies today. She was in the congregation. She's been coming here for a couple of years and her daughter's birthday, she came here. And, uh, and um, she was just really curious, is it really necessary to give up the onion and garlic? And uh, for me, I, I found it a little difficult to relate to an Indian person asking that question mm. because for a Westerner that's addicted to meat eating, intoxication and different things, it's a quantum leap mm-hmm. you know, to become a pure vegetarian. But somehow, the taste of prasadam <laughs> is very, very wonderful. Mm. So I just uh, sort of encouraged her to, you know, make a situation where she can, um, you know, have you know, offer her food to God and make it prasadam. Yeah. Mm. The, the idea with abstaining from the onion and the garlic is because these foods are so strong that they agitate the senses. You know, when we eat them, uh, they agitate the senses and therefore the mind becomes disturbed. Yeah, it, it interferes, you know, with our... Um, with the senses and the mind is described as the sixth sense mm-hmm. yeah so that is why Hare Krishna's avoid garlic and onion but we're not the only religious group exactly. who does that there are several groups in, in uh, throughout Asia several religious groups who avoid onion and garlic for generally for, for the same reasons mm-hmm. yeah it's not it's not really more complicated than yeah. that yeah and even I had ordered like food from the restaurant for my daughter's birthday Mm-hmm. Like I was aware, like it's all about garlic and onion free food. Like mm-hmm. I'm hundred percent vegetarian, mm-hmm. but for some reason on that day I decided to go for like garlic and onion free food as well. I didn't know the reason behind it, but I simply ordered that from the restaurant. That was awesome. The food mm-hmm. was awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'll tell you what I have experienced uh, after being onion free and garlic free for several decades, and then uh, eating a. Uh, some meal uh, that was that did have garlic in it. Yeah, I was travelling. I was out travelling, and I, th- uh, I w- ate at a vegetarian restaurant. But uh, but they had put a lot of onion and garlic in it, and uh, it was actually burning my stomach. Yeah, it was it was painful. Yeah, you know, that's mm. that's after not having it for several years. So I could really tell the difference between the two different. Um, uh, diets, yeah, like that. Yeah, we do sometimes uh, compromise when there's a health situation. Some naturopaths or devotees that are practicing naturopathy may take garlic in specific instances for a health thing, but we don't really like the taste of it after we give it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they call it as a sattvic, tamasic, and rajasi food, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the the sattvic sattvic means goodness foods in the mode of goodness so these are fresh fruits uh, fresh fruits fresh vegetables nuts and seeds 
uh, fresh grains and milk products that are taken from cows that are protected. Yeah, and then the rajasic food, that's uh, food in the mode of passion. That's foods that are very salty, uh, too strong and bitter, like, for example, like the onion and garlic, That foods that agitate the senses, yeah. Um, and foods that are prepared in a hurry, you know, like fast food. Mm. Like that. And then you have foods in the mode of ignorance, uh, tamagun, uh, which is uh, decomposing food, like flesh, animal flesh. Uh, it's also food that has been prepared, you know, a long time before, such as preserved foods and uh, produced in an unclean place and with, with a bad consciousness. Yeah, so that's, your, that's the really negative food that you absolutely want to avoid. Okay. Yeah. I was a bit curious about the food like that I should be offering to Lord Krishna, okay? Let's say I'm traveling overseas mm. and let's say I'm boarding in an airplane, right? And I have ordered like a hundred percent vegetarian meal, okay? What do you think? Like, can I offer that food before I eat to Lord Krishna? Yes, yes. Um, the food, you know, of, like Krishna really relishes... A vegetarian food, okay. Yes. So Krishna really relishes uh, food that has been prepared by his devotees. It's been, you know, a lot of attention and love and care has been taken to prepare the food and we choose all the ingredients according to what we know Krishna likes. So that is Krishna's favorite food. But, you know, still, if we are, for example, traveling and uh, we don't have time to do the proper procedures, still, yes, w- we should offer all the food uh, that is proper, yeah. Okay, okay, with a clean soul and heart, isn't it? Yes. Like saying, like, all about Lord Krishna, I didn't get any time to make you feel <laughs> right here. Con- oh. Confidence, it's a Ladini. It's a, you know, it's, it's a lesser, lesser standard, um, and devotees feel... If they do have the time to prepare and take some samosas on the plane, that would be definitely preferable. Yeah. But in instances where it's difficult and not, then you offer it to Krishna, purify the food. It hasn't been prepared by your devotee, but I'm using it to keep my body and soul together for yeah. your service. Krishna mm-hmm. understands, you know, he understands. Yeah, so All right. you just do your best under the circumstances. Yeah. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Hey, let's say I'm hungry, all right? I got around 8 o'clock in the morning. I had a big brunch at my home, right? Because in some of the religions, some some of the cultures, like what they believe is all about, like, wow, like you have to go and you have to worship them at first, and then only it comes all about your food. Mm-hmm. Then only you can have your breakfast, or then only you can have your mm-hmm. brunch, you know? Mm-hmm. So what is the concept about uh, Lord Krishna consciousness over here? Okay, well, I'm going to put. A, I'm going to answer this by putting a question back to you. Okay, okay. <laughs> what in that circumstance that you gave me? Uh, what is it that made you choose to come to a Hare Krishna farm to have a meal rather than go down to the corner store? Obviously, it's something or someone here that has attracted you exactly. to coming here. You're seeing Krishna understands this, right? In fact, Krishna discusses this also that there are different types of people that will come to him for different reasons, and all of them are acceptable you know, to, to Krishna like some come to Krishna uh, because they are curious you know, some come to him because they are seeking perhaps some prosperity in life um, others may come to him because they are feeling distressed and yet others may come because they are actually looking for uh, the truth about life but all of these sorts of different people are accepted by Krishna so you know if, if you decide like say if you are sitting at home and you are thinking oh look I just feel like going and having, you know, a Hare Krishna meal. Uh, I don't really feel like going to, into the temple, but I really, really would like some Hare Krishna food. That's okay. Come anyway, you know. And um, because, you know, actually uh, our food, which is called prashad, right? So the process that I was describing earlier. So our food is prashad. It, it, prashad means the mercy of the Lord. Uh, it is said that prashad is actually non-different from Krishna. So uh, we understand that. Perhaps all the people that enjoy our food, they don't understand that, but we understand that. So we understand that there is a reason why somebody may be attracted to our food and just keep coming. Like, for example, in our Mawulamba uh, mm-hmm. temple, 
I know that because I used to live there for uh, over two decades. I know that uh, during our Sunday feasts, there were certain mem- uh, certain um, gentlemen who lived in the um, Mawulumba township. Uh, I don't think we ever got to know their names, but they would come every single Sunday without fail. They would come and they would really enjoy the meal and then they would go. They wouldn't get really involved with anyone, but they, they would just come and really enjoy the food and then go. And this, this sort of kept going for many, many, many years. So we accept them because we understand that they are coming, um, you know, because also... It, in the case of my Wollnabar, it's a bit of a drive, you know, from the township out to the farm. It's not like it's just around the corner. So they are making an effort to come. Yeah, so we, we accept that also. Yeah. I, I can relate with those gentlemen. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow Krishna can get you, whether it's the philosophy or the food or the yeah. dancing. Yeah, it's it's okay, you know, because th- th- there is another aspect to this that whenever somebody comes to a a Krishna temple or a Krishna restaurant, uh, they uh, they are surrounded by a particular atmosphere. So you know, if those gentlemen, for example, in my Wollumbah or anyone else, if they were not um, uh, attracted to that spiritual atmosphere, then they wouldn't keep coming. But they are attracted, exactly. and so they keep coming. So, you know, eventually one day, ah, a little light might go on, switch on, and they might actually start thinking about the, the teachings, mm-hmm. and they might want to learn a bit more. Yeah, But even if they don't, it's okay with us. You know? Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. You got any examples, like where any of the person is quite attracted to, let's say, the programs offered here? And then, like, he became the devotee of Lord Krishna. Okay. You got any examples? Yeah, I got a personal yeah, one. Bit, yeah. didn't I? When I was uh, living in uh, King's Cross, as a bit of a wayward young man, then we had an idea to go and be religious tonight and have some free food at the Hare Krishna Ashram Temple. It was very delicious. And then uh, later on, we returned once or twice, and um, I was a little apprehensive about cults and things, and... Uh, one of the ladies at the temple, you know, hosted me and offered me a meal and, you know, started to give me some of the philosophy and I was quite rude with her. And another person personality overheard that and he said, don't worry about that, just feed him anyway. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've completely humiliated, <laughs> put in my place. <laughs> and uh, gradually uh, I, uh, a bit of humility started to rise after some time and Eventually, after many years, that lady, her name was uh, something Satcha, Param- no, Satcha. Anyway, it's an American lady, you probably know her. No, I apologised to her on the internet one time. She said, anyway, you took to Krishna consciousness, so you're absolved from that <laughs> offence. <laughs> we, we also have some uh, very uh, almost comical stories also where, you know, for example, there have been individuals in the broader community who have made, either made fun of the Hare Krishnas or they've been a bit antagonistic towards us. Like I think uh, th- there was one story about um, uh, when the uh, devotees were out uh, singing and chanting on the footpath, as we do, and there was one who was being very obnoxious. I think he might have been throwing beer bottles or something. And, um, you know, uh, this was his original approach <laughs> to okay. the devotees but but eventually he actually became a devotee himself oh, wow. yeah so you know the, 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 this process uh, and and there are other cases like that so this process is so uh, potent you know and so purifying on a very deep level you know it purifies the individual uh, that really anybody is uh, corrigible um, yeah, I th- I'm thinking of another case. Do you know this one, Kalia? That there was um, somebody was putting. Uh, th- th- there, w- there was um, a visitor who uh, was being put to the test uh, in America in the early days. Uh, somebody who had been challenging the devotees. It might have been a neighbor who, you know, of, of a particular temple, and the devotees put this test to this um, this neighbor. Okay, you you come and live our lifestyle, you know, and just just uh, even though you are very antagonistic towards us, you know, come and live with us for a month or a few months 
and and you know so that then you, you will understand why we are doing what we are doing and that person also ended up becoming uh, a mm-hmm. devotee yeah so do you feel like all the devotees or potential devotees let's say mm-hmm. have some connection with lord krishna in their past life what do you think about this I I would say that it is highly probable. Uh we cannot answer that question precisely of course, you know, because uh, most of the time uh, we don't have detailed knowledge about our past lives. Uh but um we do learn from the Vedic scripture that if a person has been a devotee, a, a practitioner in a previous life, then uh, yes, they will continue on their devotional path. Krishna himself will ensure will ensure that they are in their next birth that they are given a situation whereby they can continue their devotions. Um it may also be a case where for example somebody in their past life or in their past few lives have been leading up to the um time when they can actually uh, take birth as a devotee or when they are ready to take to the krishna conscious process because you know krishna consciousness is um uh some people say it's a little bit like you know putting the the washing machine on on the high speed cycle mm-hmm. right in terms of cleaning you know the cleansing of the soul and the mind and the heart you know to come away from material desires to come away from materialism um especially if one wants to take to it wholeheartedly and really you know uh live the live the lifestyle uh to its um uh most uh to its highest um standard shall we say yeah so um yeah this is um uh this is our understanding of uh the path of the soul that comes to krishna consciousness yeah okay and I had an interesting uh interaction with my sister recently who professes herself to be an atheist but uh um I was visiting Perth a few months ago and I stayed at her house again she's a vegetarian and she's always been accommodating seeing that Krishna consciousness helped me but every time I say something no I'm an atheist <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. this time we were talk she's uh, sort of um ta- gone to child care in the last few years and she's done a degree in it and sort of changed her career so she's working with children and it's pretty demanding a lot of the time mm-hmm. and I was mentioning I just sort of mentioned briefly about sometimes you see proclivities or propensities in in children um you know they're just like I remember some of the young boys here including my son they just hardly could toddle and they were wanted, wanting to play the drum and I think where does it come from and I mentioned something that my sister my sister is working with these babies now all the time that she said Yep, I can see it's not the first time around. <laughs> mm, mm. A lot of the uh, you know things that come out. Mm. That's okay. practice it's practical. All righty. So, what do you guys think all all about like who is a real yogi? I'm trying to relate this because now for me I run a household, right? I am active father. active husband like i need to feed my family or like me and my wife like we need to just like run our family together right what is the concept of like real yogi being a yogi let's say mm. putting on all these like saffron mm. clothes and dress and everything right so the, the do i need to leave my household to be a yogi no no the word yoga you know it uh it is the same as uh it comes from the same word as the english word yoke right you know when you yoke together two bullocks for example when you're plowing the field right so yoga means to link right uh so yoga to do yoga means to link with the supreme and there are many different types of yoga as we know there's hatha yoga asana yoga um, buddhi yoga and so forth but bhakti yoga is said to be the topmost yoga Alrighty. it is above all the other yoga like ra, ra, um, astanga yoga and the uh, pranayama yoga um so and the reason why bhakti yoga is said to be the topmost yoga which means that the practitioners of bhakti yoga are called bhakti yogis yeah the reason it is the topmost process topmost yoga is because when you are practicing bhakti yoga you are using um 
all of the other yogas, all of them are included in the process of bhakti yoga, right? It's it's the the fruition of all of the other yogas, mm -hmm. and bhakti yoga. Uh, in bhakti yoga, you are connecting with the supreme uh, through devotion, and that means the heart, right? And what that means is uh, that you are desiring to do active service to the Supreme Lord and connecting with Him in a loving relationship. And that can be done in any state of life. It can be done whether you're rich or poor or single or married, whether you're um, you know, uh, healthy or unhealthy. Uh, you can always do a little service for the Lord, and therefore you are a bhakti yogi. Right? Okay. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, uh, if one offers me with love and devotion uh, a, f a little fruit, a little flower, a bit of water, or even a leaf, I will accept it. So this is how kind and compassionate Krishna is. You know, even if we offer him, if we have nothing else to offer Krishna, we can just offer him a little leaf, and he will accept it. And that is a bonus process of uh, bhakti yoga okay yeah. okay so it's all about like there's no any requirement like someone has to be sannyashi or he, no. you like yogi in real isn't it these are all different roles that okay one can play in the in this social structure you know a renunciate or a family person um, but uh, ultimately uh, everyone is offered the chance by Lord Krishna to link up with him regardless of the external dress that we are you know playing the role we're playing we've got the opportunity to link up with Krishna whether one's a child even the children can can um, ex ex exhibit or express you know love for Krishna mm. okay, um, because okay. they have a simple heart mm. so this is what Krishna really appreciates is simple heartedness and he loves cows because cows are very simple hearted they don't <laughs> hide, their, <laughs> hide their emotions so right. this is, yeah, so this is, you know, um, uh, this is the meaning of yoga. Yeah, it's to, uh, bhakti yoga is to connect with Krishna, you know, through this loving devotion. And yes, it's, you know, uh, like Kalia was saying, you know, uh, a child may be, uh, you know, uh, offering something to Krishna with a very pure heart whereas you could have somebody who is like in your typical mm -hmm. vision of a yogi you know wearing saffron or orange uh, or enunciate uh, who may not actually be uh, doing that process um, with the same feeling as say a child or yeah. a mother who is surrounded by shopping and kids you exactly. know every day yeah so it's uh, as Kalia was saying that these are external roles or a father who is surrounded mm -hmm. by obligations uh, and commitments in, exactly. in the business world yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah. so it's really uh, it's very much up to the individual mm -hmm. uh, and it but it can be done by anyone at any time yeah All righty. Mm. so I was trying to give this message to let's say some person like we're tending towards secularity and everything you know at the moment like there's a difference like all about modernization all about traditional religion and practice and all about a bit of secularity at the moment well krishna consciousness yeah. is the uh is the um uh what do you say it's sort of the the synthesis yeah. of everything because it's got modernity as yeah. we were explaining Vladin is explaining modern I instruments or technology it can yeah. be used in a way that's conducive for our our, our um, spiritual focus mm -hmm. or it can be used in a way which is you know um, bad for us mm. so modern things we, we don't criticise per se yeah. But for ourselves, we have the privilege of living in a more simple setting mm -hmm. and experiencing Krishna consciousness more in nature. Mm. And, you know, uh, and in addition to that, yeah, we, we are aware that uh, a lot of um, industrialized um, uh, produce, like uh, not, not produce, but products. Uh, pr products, things that are manufactured, you know, in in the commercial and industrial settings. Uh, a, a, most of them, or a, a lot of them, are not being used properly, you know, for the satisfaction of the Lord, which is what you know. They, you know, again, it's a case of 
uh, people and companies taking natural resources from the earth and then misusing those. So there is a lot of, you know, sadly, the earth is today, uh, Mother Earth is being exploited for her natural resources. Yeah. And a lot of what is manufactured is being misused. And, and, and then it becomes, you know, it just becomes a waste. It becomes a waste of human endeavor. It becomes a waste of the earth's uh, pristine beauty and natural resources. Uh, because as we were saying earlier, even though we don't uh, dismiss modern um, things, such as this microphone and headset, mm -hmm. uh, we are aware that uh, we, are, uh, we don't actually need so much of these things in order to spread the message of Krishna consciousness and to live very peacefully and in harmony with other living beings. You know? Okay, okay. So... Actually, we have come to the end of this podcast now, and I haven't realized like it went like a snap, you know, like snap of like all the time and everything. It was and like a flow. Me too. Uh, <laughs> uh, Nipping, isn't it? It's getting dark now. It seemed like you were just <laughs> asking the questions from your own genuine curiosity rather than. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Alrighty, so I believe like my listeners would also like to know a lot more from you. So. What is the best route to come to Millfield? Like, it's all on the website, I know that, yeah, it is, right? Yeah. People, but what could be the simple, uh, let's say, the directions for them? It's only two hours from, from the centre of Sydney, two, two, two hours to two and a half hours. You drive up the M1 and come off at the Curry, Cessnock Curry Curry exit and then follow your GPS, and we're only about uh, 20 minutes from the town of Cessnock, the little town of Millfield, and we're just... Uh, Mm. Two two kilometres from the main Millfield town. So, alrighty. Um, in the old days, we had to give everyone flying lessons how to get here. Turn left, okay, turn yeah. right. <laughs> Just put on the map, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's alleviated from that now. Go to the GPS. Go to the website. Alrighty. So my impression with Kalia Prabhu is all about when I was quite. I think that was my first time over here, and I was asking his name right. What's your name? He told me like Kalia. That was like something impressive for me, right? So, what about if we end our this podcast with a bit of your introduction? And how did you get this name, like Kalia Prabhu and Ladini? Yes, yes. yes. How, how did we so get Kalia our names? Prabhu? Like, how yeah. did you get a name, oh. Kalia Prabhu? There you okay. go, yeah. isn't it? Kalia is a, let's say, uh, a I think it refers to Lord Krishna. Himself, yeah? I think in a... Kalia Krishna? Yeah, Kalia Krishna refers to Lord Krishna, and it's a name of one of Krishna's leelas, where he danced on the heads of a thousand-headed serpent who was residing in the Yamuna River and polluting its waters. So uh, Krishna defeated the Kalia serpent. Kalia was blessed to have the footprints of Krishna on his hoods, and then he was banished to the ocean. But he was blessed by Krishna... That he, he wasn't killed, but he was blessed by Krishna to, uh, you know, be purified of his contamination. So my spiritual master, he said, you know, just like Kaliya was purified by the lotus feet of the Lord, if you follow devotional service, you'll also be purified. So okay. it's the name of Krishna, and all our names include the name Das or Dasi, which means mm -hmm. servant of Krishna who performs wonderful pastimes. All righty, all righty. And what's all about your role at uh, Gokula Farmer Millifield? My role is like a coordinator manager here. Okay. And uh, my interest is, uh, um, my main area is, is looking after the cows here. Exactly. Or helping with looking after the cows and uh, yeah, just helping coordinate the affairs. We have a management committee that you, you know about here and we, uh, mm -hmm. we try to you know, um, facilitate the, the interests of the devotees in different directions. Okay. So it's a work in progress. <laughs> alrighty, alrighty. What about you, Ladini? Yeah, so my name uh, was also given to me by my guru. So uh, Ladini, it's actually one of Radharani's names. So um, Krishna always appears with his eternal consort, whose name is Radharani, right? But uh, just like Krishna has an unlimited number of names, uh, so also Radharani has an unlimited number of names, and one of those names is Ladini. So Ladini means one who gives pleasure and happiness uh, okay. to Krishna. Yeah, but again, you know, uh, just as Kali was saying um, 
the name Das and Dasi is always there, which means that, you know, like I'm a I'm, um, uh, servant of Radharani who gives pleasure and happiness to Krishna. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. All righty, uh, Kalia and Ladini. Thank you so much for being my guest for this episode of my podcast. So, I really feel grateful. Number one, like I was given this space mm -hmm. and we're just like chatting like since hours and hours, isn't it? Yeah. It's a divine mm -hmm. space for me. Like, I normally request my guests to come to this uh, studio setup like I have created at my home. But this time I thought like that, that's what I was requesting with Brett. Like, all right, let's do it at the temple straight away. Mm -hmm. So I can get that divine feeling as well, isn't it? I really enjoyed. Yeah, it's been very nice chatting with you, Vipin. Thank yeah. you so much. Like, you guys were so helpful for me in terms of like answering all my curiousness in a very simple way oh, well hopefully we've uh, satisfied some of your uh, uh, listeners yeah <laughs> with uh, perhaps their their own questions and, and curiosities yeah uh, all right i uh, I, uh, I enjoyed uh, you know responding and hearing the responses to your questions which i thought were well thought out and relevant questions mm. so okay did some good background work there and uh you know, you're helping to, you know, um, people to come in contact with the message of Krishna consciousness. So mm -hmm. thank you for facilitating a conversation about Krishna consciousness. Bipin. It's all good. Mm, thank you very much, Vipin. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you.